Hello and welcome to jasonnewland.com. My name's Jason Newland and this is Relaxation Hypnosis for Stress, Anxiety and Panic Attacks. Please only listen when you can safely close your eyes. Now I'm just going to talk for a while about an idea that I heard on, I think it was an audio book. I can't remember exactly the source. Yeah, you mean, oh, sending myself to sleep. But the the sentence I heard, and it was someone was talking about. It's kind of like positivity, negativity, how we're affected by positivity, how we're affected by negativity and that kind of stuff, and how our minds work. And this, this per, I mean, it might have been a man or woman, I gen, genuinely cannot remember. I listen to so much stuff, I read so many books, I can't, I kind of lose track a little bit, I should try to sort of make notes of who says what but most of what I say is just coming from my own mind anyway but it's it's kind of stimulated by sometimes what someone else has said so the idea really is that when we're born babies small children growing up we believe everything that we hear we believe it we believe everything that we're told by parents so every negative thing thousands and thousands and thousands of times repeated throughout those first few years of our life we believe we don't even question it do not question it at all and even when we get to the point where we start questioning so much is actually sunk in that we've already affected deeply by that negativity. Those put downs, those limitations that other people have put on us, telling us that we're not good enough, we can't do that, you'll never be able to do this, you'll never be able to do that, you're not clever enough, whatever it might be. It might be to do with appearance, it could be lots of different things. All limiting that come from outside but as adults it comes from inside because it's already in there so it feels like it's us saying it and who are we to argue with ourselves if I'm telling myself that I'm useless and that I shouldn't be making recordings what who would want to listen to me what if I why should anyone want to listen to me? You know, if, I, if I'm saying that to myself, then on some logical, a logical kind of way, I feel that I should be listening to that. Like, okay, fair enough. I shouldn't be doing these recordings because I'm too stupid to do it. I'm not. I'm not educated enough. I, what, what do I know? So there's a little bit of logic in my brain. A little bit that says, well, you should be listening to yourself. But then another big part, a big part, and it's growing, a bigger part is saying, well, who is that saying that? Who, who is that that's telling me that I'm going to feel anxious when I do this or that um, people are going to be staring at me when I'm walking down the street? Or that me, me boobs aren't big enough, or my boobs are too big, or I'm too tall, or I'm too fat, my belly's too big. No belly can be too big. Big bellies are fashionable. Trust <laughs> Maybe not. But mine is. I've got a big, proud beer belly. I don't even drink beer. You know? Or you're the wrong colour. You're the wrong, you've got the wrong colour hair, or you it's, all of that is bullshit. It is all bullshit. It's just stupid 
we're not stupid for thinking it, but it is stupid stuff. And I'm, I'm putting that as a very, very important aside. Don't ever, ever, ever call yourself stupid. Please. If you don't take anything from this, if, if you just stop this recording now and go off sailing the, the world, whatever, you know, on your yacht. Andre just did the biggest sneeze I've ever heard in my life. That wasn't a ferret sneeze. That sounded like about 17 ferrets all getting together and sneezing. Wow. So, promise me, you will never call yourself stupid. Out loud, internally, or even as a joke. Not even as a joke. And I love jokes. I love silly humour. But it's, there's a line. There's a line. Never call yourself stupid. Just promise me that. And it will make a difference to your life. It will make less of a difference to your life if you never call yourself stupid anyway. Because you're already kind of there, in a sense. But there might be an equivalent. Uh, another th- a term might be, I'm always anxious. Stop saying that to yourself. Stop telling other people that. Stop reinforcing it. And you might be saying, well, yeah, but I am anxious. And yeah, I'm not saying that that's not the case because I'd imagine a lot of people listening to these this podcast is coming because of anxiety and stress and that's why I'm making a recording because that's where I've come from and that's the audience I'm, I guess, aiming at. But telling yourself that is not useful. It's the equivalent of going for a minor, minor surgical procedure or going to the dentist and saying over and over and over again in your head, this is going to hurt, this is going to hurt, this is really going to hurt, this is really going to hurt. And you just step outside yourself for a second. And then you're sitting beside the um, chair and you've got someone in the chair that you love dearly, grandparent, parent, child, nephew, niece, whoever, someone that you care about. And would you, maybe a child is this terrified of the dentist, would you be, you know, sitting there, and it's not funny, I don't know why I'm laughing, but would you be sitting there saying, this is going to hurt, this is really going to hurt, this is really, really going to hurt? I suppose I'm laughing because of the absurdness of it, because it would never happen. But that's what we're doing to ourselves with things like anxiety, stress, you know, waiting for a bus. I'm going to be stressed when the bus gets here. It's going to be full of people. It's going to be full of people. I'm going to get stressed. I'm going to get stressed. It's going to be full of people. People are going to be looking at me, going to be staring at me. Um, whether or not people will look at you, there's going to be quite a few people on the bus that will look at you because there isn't much else to do on the bus Really, is it? You stay, sit on the bus, the bus stops at a bus stop. And I generally just look at the person that's getting on. Not for any other reason other than there isn't much else t- to do on the bus. It's a quite a, a limiting place for activities. You know, if they start putting a big screen, you know, TV, movies, and maybe have a little circus in the back of the bus so we can watch it. You know, some clowns riding around on bicycles, unicycles. Maybe then, a bit of juggling. Wouldn't be looking at the people and getting on the bus. But until that happens, I'm going to be looking, just for the sake of there's nothing else to do. Also, there's another thing worth thinking about is 
most people have got no interest in you or me or anyone else. They're just interested in themselves. I don't mean all the time, but when they're, you know, well, maybe a lot of the time, and I think that goes for most people, we have to look out for ourselves. We are our own keepers, aren't we? We are responsible for every aspect of our own lives. So you might get on a bus and people might look over, but there's going to be very little interest in their mind. They're not going to be thinking of you when they're at home. They're going to be thinking of whatever they're thinking of. Unless you get on, get on, and start singing, and you know, the winner takes it all. You know, start singing an ABBA song at the top of your voice. You might be uh, conversation worthy over the dinner table that evening. But generally. You know, people are into their own thing. They're in their own minds, thinking about their own stuff, feeling sorry for themselves, or maybe looking forward to something, or just pondering over something that happened. Or you, you know, you could also think that if you're sitting in a room with two hundred people, you're not the only one in there with anxiety issues. You're not the only one in there. It's like there'll be there'll be more than two people with depression or that have recently been depressed, or that will be depressed in the future. In fact, more than two people. In fact, you could say pretty much, I'd say 100% of the people in, the, in this country will be depressed at some point if they haven't already been. They just won't class it as depression. They won't acknowledge it as depression, but it will have been depression, even if it, it didn't last for very long. Still depression. Just might not be clinical, might not be clinically depressed. So, so that's kind of the idea. I'm thinking we'll start off with the idea of we accept any thought, any suggestion... So basically, a small child is the best hypnotic subject there could ever be. Like a baby, a, to a toddler. Just, uh, you know, it's just as they start to get to learn to talk, and they believe everything you tell them. Now, technically, a great subject, but you can't get a little toddler to do stage hypnosis or run around like a chicken or, you know, that kind of stuff, because they're... They wouldn't know, they wouldn't have those references to sort of work with. But they will believe what you tell them. And as we get older, we start to question. We start to learn that people lie. Some people lie, I guess. Maybe we all lie to a certain extent, you know, in different ways over the years. But, you know... I think we, we learn the lies that hurt us. We hear someone lying and they've, we trusted them and then we find out that they lied. And we learn that at a very early age. It might not be anything serious, but it might feel serious when you're six. It might feel like it's the end of the world when actually it's, it's pretty much nothing. But at the time it felt big. So you start to question. It's like, well... And also you start to get evidence against what you've heard. Because if you're at home all the time, as a, as a little child, you're not out in the world. You're not seeing anything that contradicts. Maybe on television you do, but other than that, you don't see any contradictions to what you're being told about yourself. So if you've got a parent saying, oh, you're never going to be... By the way, that's Andre in the background... I don't know what it is about me recording. So I'm doing this quite early. It's like 6.30 in the uh, evening. He just wakes up. He's been asleep for absolute hours and he just wakes up as soon as I start recording. It's not my voice because I've been on the phone, didn't bother him. 
but as soon as I do a recording, he's up. So kids take this, they take it on board and they just believe it. And then they start to get mixed messages. They see the parents lying to each other or saying one thing and doing another thing. Maybe telling them not to do something and then doing it themselves. You know, that kind of uh, stuff that's constantly going on. They might see their brothers and sisters lying or saying one thing, doing another thing. Um, lying to get out of trouble and then sort of not really understanding why. And it's, you know, it's a very complicated process, the old communication, I guess. I've not, I've not really figured it out myself. So believing what you're told, you start to question it a little bit, I would say. And then, but then it gets hard because you don't know what to believe anymore. Because you've got years of this stuff that's been absorbed into you without any, there's no filter, it just went straight in. There was no one to stop it. You couldn't stop it because you didn't know to stop it or how to. All that negativity that came in. And there's going to be a lot of positivity as well, hopefully. But your mind's not going to know which is which. Just going to accept all of it. Just accepts it because you've let it in, you allowed it in. You've consciously said, yeah, go on. Or well, you've basically just not consciously got involved, just allowed it to all sink in. All the garbage and all the good stuff all in one place. So then as we get older, we're able to choose what we allow in. But we might we might not know that we can. And it can take some people a whole lifetime to realise that, wait a minute, I can choose what I allow myself to believe. I can, I can choose what, what negativity I allow inside my head from other people. I don't have to absorb it. And, you know, some people don't get... They don't get into that until they're in their 60s or 70s. Some people start to do it when they're in their late teens or maybe even early teens. I'm aiming to start doing it when I'm about 93. That's my, that's my plan. Until then, I'm going to believe everything everyone says about me. No, I'm not. And that limitation... And in some ways, I suppose you could say, well, what's this got to do with stress and anxiety? Well, huge amount. Huge amount, because there's a lot, there's a big, there's, there has to be a big connection between low self-esteem and anxiety. Not always, I mean, it's low self-esteem and PTSD. It doesn't matter if you're, I think, the army and the armed forces has proven that, you know, very successfully that it doesn't matter how well prepared or how um, positive and confident you feel when a traumatic event happens, it has an effect. You know, and there's no one more prepared than the armed forces for trauma. That's what they're trained for. They're trained right from the start to deal with serious trauma, serious, serious stuff. And yet they still, maybe not everyone, but a lot of people still have post-traumatic stress disorder used to be called shell shock, you know, in the war. Uh, in fact, I don't know if it was the Second World War, but it's, it definitely in the First World War, people who got shell shock um, and refused to go back on a battlefield would be shot dead. So, yeah, that's what we used to do with people with PTSD during the, for at least the First World War. It might happen in the Second World War as well, I don't know. So, you know, you think that 
it's not really that long ago. You know, it's a hundred years ago. And people with PTSD would be shot. Maybe not in civilian land, but they would be put in an asylum probably. But if they were in the army and they refused to pick up their rifle and come out of the trenches and face a firing squad from the other from the enemy, they would be <laughs> they would be shot. I mean it's not much of a choice, is it? So it shows that how I suppose it is it seems to be judgmental towards people from a hundred years ago. Um but for me, from my perspective, I see it, well, where is the humanity? Why would you learn, why would we need to learn humanity? That's not education. That's, isn't that inbuilt in us to not want to hurt another person? Isn't that, isn't that, isn't it? <laughs> Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. I just felt that would be something that's inbuilt. And maybe, maybe things like wars and those kind of things is what caused people to be, to lose track of that. So I suppose if they're killing the enemy, they've no longer got that value for human life that perhaps they used to. And probably everybody would be affected mentally by being in the war including the officers who were able to give the command for someone with PTSD to be shot dead because they wouldn't get out of the trenches or leave the hospital to go and fight again so that's a that's a weird old thing but that's that's the past but it's relevant because I wonder where we're going to be in a hundred years time. I'll probably be on my fourth heart and my second head because I'm pretty. I'm guaranteeing uh, artificial intelligence and you know growing new parts of the body and stuff. That's what I'm hoping. So I'm still going to be alive for another few hundred years. So <laughs> that's my plan. And I just, when it comes to starting off with that idea of we absorb everything, it literally, I get the image of rain, like a a little baby's head, and the, the, the scalp, you know, the is almost open for this rain just to land inside the head and the rain represents everything that they hear everything that they get told and continues with that everything they're told about themselves oh you're never going to be able to do that all that um, dream destroying the adults are quite good at not only to you know for kids but we're good at destroying our own dreams aren't we let's face it it's 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 a skill that again i think that we we learn but we're very good at it and you can do it with humor you can do it with venom you can just do it in passing or you can do it accidentally I think my nan did a little bit like that about dreams with me. She, she was never said I was I wanted to do something. She'd, uh, well, not every, but sometimes she'd say, "Yeah, I used to have dreams as well. I, I wanted to be in the Peace Corps and travel the world." Then, <laughs> then I got married, and had your dad, <laughs> who had you. So uh, you're to blame. <laughs> so she she didn't say that. But, you know, she had dreams. And I think that's sometimes the case with older people. 
well, people like me, even if I had a kid, I could say, well, if my kid said I want to be an astronaut, I could say, yeah, well, I wanted to be a train driver, but I didn't get to do that. You know, life doesn't always work out the way you want it to, does it? So just eat your dinner and go back and watch television like a normal child. It That would scare me that if I was like that. But it's easy to squash people's dreams, even in a humorous way, but it still has an effect, especially with children, more, more with children than with adults. Because it can happen to adults with children without them even getting angry or upset. They just accept it as the truth. Because for a small child, the parents are gods. The parents are everything. Even parents that are horrible are still everything to a child. So, yeah... There's a lot of responsibility, but I'm not going to give parenting advice to anyone because I'm not a parent. But this is, uh, it changes then, so we get older. And we've still got all that crap in our head, that negative stuff, that limiting stuff, which lowers the self esteem or gets in the way of your self-esteem and confidence growing. There was a time, it's not really that long ago really, when I used to believe, really believe, that I had nothing to say of any worth. That any thought I had was absolutely useless and of no interest and didn't mean anything. And part of the reason for that is because the people I was around, I spent time with older people who talked down to me. And really it was like their, what they had to say and nothing else mattered. It was their word. It was, whether it was whatever it was, so if they were racist or homophobic or if they were gay or if they were, you know, it's like, this is the way things should be, this is the way things are. And there seemed to be a lot of that. I'm not, of course not everyone's like that, but I just, I was just really lucky that I managed to be around people that were, I think the only, the, the saving grace, I knew people that were very, very different. So I had friends that were proper homophobic. And then I had another friend that was gay, a proper, not proper gay, but he was gay. And because I was young, I was in my teens, I got to see kind of both sides of the story, in a sense. And in the same way, I had friends, uh, friends that were racist. I never understood it. Uh, then I dated a black girl when I was 20. And I could see, I saw a different side to the, to the situation. I'm no expert on either side, because I just I'm not. But I realised that it's really useful if you can see both sides, or at least sort of step out of it and say, OK, I can kind of see both sides and not take a side. But it's very, very, very difficult. I found that every single friend I've ever had wanted me to take their side and I understand it because if I've had an argument with someone it's it's something's happened in the past I've gone and spoke to my friend about it I want them to take my side I do, I still do I don't really get into arguments anymore but, but I genuinely, I want people to if they're my friend I want them to support me and take my side But that's not really fair on them, is it? Really. Because they might be thinking I'm just talking complete crap. Um, 
hard to believe that I could ever come out with a bunch of crap. I mean, I hardly talk at all. Can you imagine me talking for ages? And so that's a sort of a weird thing. So I think getting to know different people as we get older, we start to realise that I think what I noticed is these people who are older, the one thing I noticed more than anything is these older people that were maybe in their 40s when I was in my uh, early 20s. As I got older, I realised that they weren't as wise and as knowing as I thought they were. And it, it, it almost felt like I was the mature one. I, I became the adult and they didn't grow. They, they'd got as far as they were going in their, um, I don't know, maybe a mental growth, maybe educationally. I don't know. But I've met a lot of people that just didn't grow. They didn't, they didn't change. They just stayed the same. And there's, I see that on you on YouTube or Facebook sometimes over the years. And I'm never going to change. I'm always going to be the same. With pride, they say it with pride, like real, like with pride. You can't change me. Now I, I agree with that bit. I understand the concept of uh, like saying you. I'm not changing for you. Good on you. Don't change for another person. Uh, you know, I'm, well, maybe. It depends, because I think if I was, if someone's, I've known people that have stopped doing something, someone that used to take drugs, and he stopped because he fell in love with someone, and she said she didn't want to be with someone that took drugs because her brother had an overdose and died, and he hid, he hid the drugs from her when they first met. But they fell in love very quickly, so he, he opened up about his... He wasn't into it as much. It was more... A little bit more than recreational, but it wasn't uh, addiction as such. And he, he stopped, because it was either that or lose her. And she was the most amazing woman he'd ever met, and he wanted to spend the rest of his life with her. So he decided... I'm not saying that, that anyway, everyone... Could would be able to do that because um, it's hard for a human being to compete with drugs to a lot of people. Some people, drugs is all they care about. Um, it's a minority, but there are there are people out there that nothing else matters to them as much as drugs. And I don't understand it. I don't. I'm not going to pretend to understand it. I don't get it. I don't get how anything could matter more more than eating or you know just general stuff it's got to be got to be a little bit of a hierarchy but that's just I understand on certain levels and I know people have known people personally that have you know been very involved in that lifestyle but anyway that's not about this is it that's not what this recording is about if not I'm going to get myself back on track now and the self-doubt, I guess I'm talking about that, about that because of the self-doubt that's coming from other people, other people, their views. And I think I found that I was more um, suggestible probably when I was in my late teens. Because before that, when I was in my normal teens, uh I didn't listen to anything really that I was told. No one really had an influence on me. Uh, maybe television did, but I was in it during my like middle teens. I was doing my own thing. I wasn't interested in any, anybody else. And, but when I was in my late teens, I was very, because I was on my own. Family had split up, no longer had my brothers around. Mother, mother was gone, didn't see dad very often. So I was very, um, yeah, manipulatable, if that's a word. 
was very easily led, I think, and it was older men that seemed to be attracted to me. I don't mean in a kind of a, or sometimes it was in a, a way I didn't want it to be, but they'd go out of their way to help me. And you know, even on a couple of occasions, uh, two different men actually tried to get me to go into their bed. I mean, it's like, what? Um, but I was, you know, I was very verbal back then. And I was, what I did is I went into a homophobic rant. Even though I wasn't homophobic, it, you know, it just, it kept them away from me. <laughs> if you know what I mean. I was, what, 18 at the time, 17. And I couldn't understand it. It's like, this, this isn't fair. Why? I want a girlfriend. Why are these older men trying to get into me? Um... I don't know. And maybe I was after a father figure. I don't know. Anyway, I was very easily led back then. And it's only when I really hit my 20s, like late teens, 20s, that I started to kind of wake up a bit to myself, who I was about. And things started to change gradually. But still, people were talking down to me. And what I had to say didn't wasn't important to anybody else. No one wanted to listen to me. Um, that's how it felt. And I've probably done the same to teenagers myself. i probably talked, been the same, uh, without realising it. Talked down to people. Didn't mean to. But... You know, maybe it's just one of those things that we do. Uh, I very much try not to do that now. Because, let's face it, look at old, uh, what's her name? Um, Gertrude, is it Gertrude? Uh, Gertie? Whatever her name is, the, the environmental lady. 16 year old, or 17 year old. I mean, look what an influence she's having. Obviously, yes, she hasn't influenced me enough to remember her name, but she's um, worldwide famous and she's being listened to by millions and millions of people. And she's a teenager. So it just shows that teenagers have got something to say as much, maybe even more sometimes than older people. It's not about the age, it's about the person. I think that's what it is. It's about the person, not the age of the person. Some people hit their peak when they're at a very early age. I mean, I was going to use Malcolm X as a as an example. I mean, he didn't really have any choice about what age he got to, did he? Because he was shot dead. But um, With him, it's weird because I found his talks funny. But at the same time, he was, he just, it was flaky. It's completely flaky. Like, hated white people. Then he liked, then he liked white, pe white people. Then he, then he think everyone should move back to Africa and then maybe everyone should live here separately, segregated. And it's like just moving from one thing to another. But, um, I found him funny. And he was just, you know, so it's, it's weird. I just found him, even though he was saying some weird things sometimes. And some things he said were just amazing, really, really insightful. Uh, he was, a, I guess he was a genius, he really was, but he peaked. Or maybe he didn't peak, maybe if he hadn't been killed. I was going to say he would have lived longer, but obviously. But if he hadn't been killed, he might have gone on to be, uh, who knows? He, he might have gone on to be someone like Oprah Winfrey. You know, having his own TV show and being a huge celebrity because he's already famous. Anyway, you may say, what's what's uh, Malcolm X got to do with my anxiety, please, Jason? I come here and I listen to you talk about reducing my anxiety. Well, so you've got your brain. We're not little children anymore. 
unless you are a little child, of course, then you are. But generally, I imagine people listening are adults. We don't have to allow other people's opinions and words to sink into our mind. We don't have to allow them into our brain. We have a choice not to allow it in. Just in the same way is that same sort of scenario, you know, with a kid in a dentist chair and a mother, if you saw the chit child saying to himself, I'm going to feel pain, it's going to be hard, it's going to hurt, it's going to hurt, it's going to hurt. Or the mother then saying, oh, it's going to hurt you, it's really going to hurt you. You should have done your homework because it's really going to hurt you. Yeah. Take it even absurdly, even more, I suppose, the worst kind of, there would be an absurd situation to be like the entire family getting together, all aunties and everything singing in unison, it's going to hurt you, it's going to hurt you. That, that would probably be weirder. But the dentist, all oh, this is going to hurt. Oh, I've got the drill now, this is really going to hurt, this is. How awful would that be? I mean, it's funny from a, a perspective of just hear, just saying it, just imagining it that someone else doing it. But in reality, if a, if a dentist would start to say, oh, this is really going to hurt, this is going to be the most painful thing you ever felt ever, um, you're going to, you may, you may faint, you may, oh. Regardless of what they do, it's going to be painful because you're going to feel so tense, so tense that someone could just push on your skin and it's going to be painful because you'll be so tense and stressed that actually there'll be no possibility for comfort in your body or any part of your mouth. So... This is kind of the opposite to that. So, you know, if you're... Well, first of all, you can say to yourself, whatever you want. That, that's, that's one of those things. You're free to say whatever you want to yourself. And I think we forget that. I forget it. And I just reminded myself, we actually have the freedom to say whatever we want to ourselves. And whatever we say to ourselves will be accepted into our mind. If you remember that, whatever we say to ourselves will be accepted into our minds because we're saying it and we're allowing it in. We're not stopping it. We're allowing it in. So whether you say to yourself, or let's say, if I say to myself, um, I'm going to feel tense going out, taking Andre for a walk, I'm going to feel tense and uptight. Or when I take Andre for out, I'm going to feel relaxed, I'm just going to enjoy the, the lovely evening, early evening, still light outside. I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to feel tense and anxiety, maybe angry, frustrated. Uh, might have an anxiety attack, you know. Or I'm going to feel good and feel relaxed. Whatever you say to yourself, it just goes in. Unless you question it. I mean, the question you could ask is, why would you say to yourself something that's harmful? I mean, it, it doesn't it doesn't make sense, does it? I mean, obviously, it doesn't make sense, but it doesn't it doesn't have to make sense. But it doesn't make sense. It, it's like, in fact, it's it is in the absurd league, isn't it? It's in that category of absolutely absurd. When you step back and you think, wait a minute. So whatever I say to myself, my brain accepts those as a command. 
It's a command. It's like, it's, accept- it's acceptable. That is what is. Because I've said it myself and I've let it in. Because you're not going to say something yourself and then, then stop it. Because why would you say it yourself? So taking control of what you say yourself. Because we do have control over what we say to ourselves. It's our voice. It's our mind. It's our... It's not someone else. So if you do notice something, a thought coming into your head, which isn't you, maybe something from the past, something that you've heard, maybe something you see on telly, something that did kind of slip through in the past, and you notice it and think, ah, wait a minute, that's not true at all. It's not true. And you think about it, is there anyone out there that likes being called something that they're not? That like, and is there anyone out there that likes being accused of doing something they haven't done? You know, regarding something negative. I don't even like to be accused of doing something nice. It's just like, you know, let's get it straight. Let's get things correct. But to be accused of an extreme example would probably be stealing. Someone I've been accused of stealing in the past. It's not a good example because I did actually steal, but I'm trying to think of another example. Um, I'm kidding. I'm joking. But it's... uh, No one likes it, do they? No one wants to be accused of something they haven't done. And in a sense, that stuff, like someone or accusing of being something that we're not, being a thief, being uh, a liar, or, you know, or other stuff, like you're, you're no good at that. You're not good at writing stuff. You're not good at... You can't do poetry. You can't do poetry. And that kind of stuff that might come into my mind. You're no good at that. No one would want to read your poetry. You're never going to be able to write a book. You're never going to be that kind of... Even if it's true. What use is it? It's just horrible, isn't it? I mean, can you imagine... If we got bombarded by people, if you people just kept coming into your home and telling you all the things that you can't do and are never going to be able to do, even things that are of no use. If I had someone come into the, to my f- flat and say, Jason, you're never going to be able to have a period, and walks out, like, on some level, I don't care. I'm pa- quite happy not to have had a menstrual cycle. I'm not bothered about that. But it's going to be annoying another person comes in and says um, you are never going to be able to walk on the moon which is true I couldn't be an astronaut I don't have the health to go through that training I'm never going to be able to do that but why tell me why do I need to be reminded of that stuff someone else comes in Jason you are never going to be Mr Olympia Now, I could attempt to be Mr. Olympia and I could definitely improve my body. I don't know. (laughs) I generally don't think um, it's going to happen, if I'm honest. And I've got lower back issues, which would probably get in the way of doing that kind of training. But but if you notice, I don't actually want to say, I don't want to admit that I could never be Mr. Olympia, even though... I've only got about three muscles and two of them are in my mouth. So it's, it'd be annoying to have someone completely continually telling you what you can't do, even when you know you can't do them. That is annoying enough. But then when you've got yourself telling yourself that you can't do stuff that maybe you can do. 
That's just plain out of order. I mean, you imagine, let's say, if, you, if your dream, you have a dream and your dream is to, or maybe what you want right now is to feel more relaxed when you go out. You just want to walk down the road feeling more relaxed. Uh, maybe you want to feel that people aren't staring at you. You want to feel safe on the pavement. You know, just things, general things that maybe you used to feel in the past and you want that feeling back, that feeling of security, confidence that has been uh, temporarily denied you for whatever reason, maybe due to trauma, a traumatic experience, or uh, a con- it's just connected to anxiety that's been occurring in the past. And someone comes up to you and says, oh, you're never going to be able to walk down the street without feeling tense and stressed. Another person comes up to you a little while later saying, are you feeling stressed yet? Are you feeling stressed? Another person coming up to you and saying, well, how's the anxiety levels? Is it probably rising a bit, isn't it? Well, that car was a bit close to the pavement. Did you see that? Now, if in that situation, I mean, I'd want to be start punching people. I'll be honest, I would. I'd, you know, if that happened, I'd be, I'd be carrying a baseball bat with me wherever I went. Because if I had people continuously walking up to me saying negative stuff like that, I'd just have to start breaking some kneecaps. Now, that might sound a little bit violent, <laughs> but <clears throat> this is an imaginary situation that would never happen. So it's okay to hit imaginary people that will never actually walk up to you and do that with an imaginary baseball bat. So I'm fine with that. It's not real. It's not real. But you do have these, or some of us, have these voices in our heads telling us that stuff. So, of course, you can't hit that with a baseball bat unless maybe you can. I don't mean physically with a baseball bat. I mean, in your mind. Maybe it can be like a baseball being chucked at you in your mind and you hit it away, bang. And the good thing about playing baseball in your mind or rounders, whatever you want to call it, it could be cricket, it could be a football and you're, you know, you're just kicking the ball about, kicking the ball back. You never miss. In your mind, you never miss. So if you was in a shooting range, or bow and arrow even, or playing darts, you'll always hit the bullseye whenever you want to, because it's in your mind. There is no failure in your mind. Failure can't happen if you don't allow it to. And when you realize, it's not even realize it, it's remembering. When you remember that actually your internal world is yours to enjoy and you can manipulate that internal world to be how you want it to be. Which means you can then start transforming those negative thoughts into positive thoughts or just destroying the negative thoughts altogether, just dissolving them. If there's a baseball coming towards you, a negative thought, you could just hit it all the way into the sun, just watch it just go in the sun. So we're no longer that little boy or that little girl where every single thing that's been told to us sinks in. We're not there anymore. We can decide for ourselves. We can choose for ourselves what we allow in and what we don't allow in. Lovely time for background sounds to come, isn't it? Just near the end of the recording. So Andre's in there doing some weird stuff and there's a baby out the front. I think the baby's agreeing with me. I feel I just heard the baby just said, I don't have to listen to you. I've got my own mind. Jason just said it. 
I don't have to absorb all that negativity. Because you think about it, in a way, and it's no one's fault, I mean, it's not, I'm not um, pointing fingers, but not just this generation, I reckon every single generation has been. A child is, there's a freedom there. As long as a child's eating, it's got, is, you know, it's getting everything it needs, like medication, somewhere to live, food, toys, you know, a child will be happy as long as he's being treated well. And, but the parents, in order to provide that security, that happiness, that food, that nice home, the clothes and all that stuff, they're probably putting themselves through a lot of pressure and maybe not getting the sleep they need, especially for the first year of the baby's life. And so even when the parents are talking to each other, that is being absorbed by that little baby, by that child. Even though the child might be playing, it's still absorbing that, what they're hearing. As long as they can comprehend it, of course. So there might only be two, but I don't know what, what age they start to learn to speak. I don't know. Uh, is it ten? I don't know. But <laughs> that negativity can come across, and it's not the parents' fault, because... You know, from what I've seen, parent parenthood is it's a really, really, really tough job. It's hard work, and um, it, yeah, it's to to be positive all the time is probably maybe it's beyond most people to be able to do that. So we can't change the past. As I said, this isn't a a recording for parents because. Um, they can take responsibility for what they do. This is a recording for adults and to maybe you know realize you can't change we can't change the past. I mean, you know, if we could, none of us would be you wouldn't be listening to this and I wouldn't be making this. Simple as that. If we could change the past, neither of us would be involved in this recording. You know, we would change the past, wouldn't we? That's it. We would go back and change things, and everything would change. Our whole lives would change, which means I wouldn't be doing this. I wouldn't be making podcasts or spent the last fourteen years making recordings. And you perhaps wouldn't be in a position where you'd want to listen to something like this. So you know, so we can't change the past, but we can change our minds. And we can be on guard, you know, start to spend a bit more time caring about ourselves, a bit more time being kind to yourself. That's kind of, for me, that's the the thing, to be kind, kind to yourself, to be kind. And that, that just seems to be an obvious thing to say. But to start noticing the things that you hear yourself say to yourself, especially in moments of maybe frustration or when something's not going so well. Uh, For example, maybe for me, I'll be trying to fill a form in online, trying to fill a form in and like I'll be, oh, I'm useless with forms. That's never going to help me. It's not helpful. It's it's just strengthening that belief system that I have inside that I'm no good with forms, filling forms in. So in that moment, it's about stopping that thought. And you know, if imagine it is a baseball, and you can start doing this. It's 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 actually fun. You can turn it into a game and you don't wait until you're in the midst of some kind of drama uh, where there's a lot of negativity being going through your mind. You just notice it on the day-to-day normal level. So it might be a small thing, just uh, you're thinking about maybe 
because uh, at the moment we're in lockdown around the world and and maybe well I want to go out I want to go on holiday as soon as this crap is over I want to go to a nightclub and I want to I want to kiss somebody or I want to go out with my boyfriend or my girlfriend or go out with the girls or with the boys or I want to do something you know I want to go out and then that could be that little thing I wonder if I fit into that dress or I wonder if I fit into those trousers because I might put a bit of weight on being at home for you know this long for the last few months Oh, I'm, I've eaten too much. I'm just a fatty. Straight away, it's like, wait a minute. You see how it goes negative? Even though it's it's almost a gentle negativity. It's almost a humorous. It could be like humorous in your mind. Oh, I'm a right old pig me. Mm, just not pig me. Pig me. Pig, you know. Um, I'll never stop eating. Nom, 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 nom. But even if it's turned into a joke, it's still negative. And if you're saying that to yourself, you need to find a way to knock that away. So you can do it with a baseball bat in your mind, knocking it into the sun, the baseball, so it goes, it's gone. Or you can shoot it out of the sky with a bow and arrow, with a gun, you can, with a cannon. With a, you can do any version of that that you want. It's totally up to you. I mean, you could, in your mind, punch it. You just splat it. You could, it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be violent. I mean, you could hit it away with a tennis racket. You, you know, whatever you want to do. But whenever you, or you could say something in your mind like, no, or be gone. Almost like a Harry Potter kind of, um, witchy stuff you know where you could just sell wizardry be gone thought be gone negativity and you could do you could even make up your own little rhyme uh i don't i'm trying to think off the top of my head what it could be um um okay so i think like so Be gone negativity, be gone for eternity. I don't know, you know, so it wasn't very good. Oh, I'm not gonna, I won't be patting myself on the back for that little rhyme. I'm not a wizard, you know, I don't, I can't think of, it doesn't have to rhyme either. I mean, it's about the magic, not about the words necessarily, rhyming. So these are just a few ideas. I mean, it might, you know, it might be useful. It might be really useful. It might be, but I've given you something to think about, a different perspective. Um, in some ways, it, you may feel, uh, you know, do you want to treat other people differently? It could have lots of different effects, you know. Um, the main effect I'm looking for is that you feel better now than you did before you decided to listen to this and allow yourself to open your mind to new ideas or maybe old ideas but reworked, re retold, looked at from a different angle or a few different angles. Yeah, so I think that's about it. So none of us are any longer that small child with a brain which just allows anything in. We're not there anymore. We, we vet what goes into our brains. So when someone's being negative or when we're saying something negative to ourselves, something negative, we can then decide, do I want that in there or not? I mean, I could say to myself, oh, I'm, so, uh, I'm so fat, I'm never, I'm never going to be able to uh, wear any decent clothes because I've got such a big belly. I could stop myself and say, is that true? 
regardless of whether it's true or not, is it useful? I mean, the true, I'll never be able to, you know, the, the truth part about having a big fat belly, yeah, maybe. But, you know, the idea that it's unchangeable and I'll never be able to wear nice clothes, that's not true. But the main important thing is, is it useful? Is it useful? How, how useful is that? Do you want that in your mind? Do you want that dirt? That just, ugh, in your mind? Now, I might say to myself, yep, I love, I love thinking of myself as a big fat pig. I think it's brilliant. I love it. Which would be a really weird thing to sort of say to myself. Uh, so, I think the answer would be no, I don't. I don't like that. Do I feel good thinking of myself as being, having the biggest belly on the planet? From a humorous perspective, yeah, I suppose. But in reality, I don't have the biggest belly on the planet. I'm probably third. <laughs> no, I'm not. And... So it's, I suppose it's looking at what do we say in humour that actually could still be hurting ourselves, but not in a way that's going to stop our humour, because to be able to have a sense of humour towards yourself, to not take yourself too seriously, could be one of the best things that you have, one of the best defences that you have. In, against negativity. So you might notice that you're saying something to yourself that's really negative. You don't allow it in. You say, get out. You knock it away with a tennis racket or the baseball bat. Or you put it onto a bonfire in your mind and burn it all. But at the same time, you can have a sense of humor. The idea that, where did that come from? Where did that come from? That was in there all these years. Where did it come from? That's not part of me. That's not who I am now. So it's having, you know, without, it's doing this, but without being cruel to yourself. It's noticing the things that are negative, but without being negative about them. I hope that makes sense. Didn't to me, but I hope it does to someone. <laughs> It made sense to me. I'm sure it did. So I'm going to go. I want to thank you for listening. I hope this has been useful. And I will do another recording. I'm going to try and do a long or well, a relaxation session probably. Uh, either later today or tomorrow. Which will be uh, one with music or one without. So I shall see you then. Thanks for listening. Remember to be kind to yourself because you do deserve to be happy. Lots of love. Bye.